I hope this is a stable arrangement here. All right, so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for showing up in such numbers at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, thanks to both the organizers and the staff here at PCMI for inviting me to do this. It's a pleasure to do so. So the, as Tatiana said, this talk is gonna be in some sense of an introductory nature. Um, it has to do with uh, criteria, finding criteria for, to establish the L2 boundariness of singular integrals and square functions that are not of convolution type. Uh, in the convolution case, there's a standard tool for establishing L2 boundaries. You just use the Fourier transform and Plancharel's theorem. All right, that's, that's not available in the non-convolution case, so, so other techniques had to be developed. So we're gonna talk about some of those criteria and um, you know, if I move expeditiously enough, then uh, we'll show some um, applications as well. Um, by the way, the prerequisites for the course in principle should be you know, the basics of harmonic analysis, things like knowing the four, about the Fourier transform and Plancharel's theorem, uh, knowing uh, about the hardy littlewood maximal theorem, uh, the basics of the um, calderon zygmunt singular integral theory in the, in the convolution case. If you're not familiar with those things, that's not a disaster, but it means probably there are some things that you'll need to kind of take for granted and fill in the gaps later. Okay, so first let me, let me start with some examples. Okay, so the first example, uh, sort of a fundamental example, is the Cauchy integral on a Lipschitz curve. Is that big enough? Can everyone see even in the back? It's okay, good, good, okay. So the Cauchy integral is defined as follows. So we're gonna have a, a curve, gamma, which is gonna be a Lipschitz curve in the, compl in the complex plane. So it'll be the set of x plus i a of x, <coughs> x on the line, and a is Lipschitz. Okay, and then the Cauchy integral operator is defined to be c gamma f of z, for z on the curve, it's gonna be the principal value, I'll say what that is in a second. There's a normalizing constant, one over two pi i, and we're integrating on the curve, and we have f of v, z minus v dv, okay? Sometimes that's normalized with a minus sign, it doesn't matter too much, all right? What does this principal value mean? Well, we'll say a little bit more about that a little bit later. Uh, it basically just means though that you're interpreting this in some kind of limiting sense, sort of uh, like a improper integral from first year calculus. The reason being that you'll notice that the order of the singularity here is not absolutely integrable, right? It fails to be absolutely integrable. So that's one reason it's called a singular integral. Uh, I guess that's the main reason it's called a singular integral. To, um, so you, you can't just write this down as an absolute convergent integral. You have to say what you mean. We'll say what we mean in a little bit. But just for now, think of this as being some kind of improper limiting operation, okay? Now, if we write this in, in the, if we parameterize in these graph coordinates, we have that C gamma F at the point x plus i a of x is gonna equal, oh boy, I'm filling up my board here. Okay, let me write the integrand over here. So the integrand is gonna become um, one over x minus y plus i times a of x minus a of y and then we're integrating f of y plus i a of y, and then the complex measure dv becomes one plus i a prime of y dy. And we're gonna give this object a name too, this parametric thing. We're gonna call this, let's say, c sub a of g of x, where g of x is, well, let me say it this way, g of y, 
is going to be this stuff with this factor absorbed in. And this is a harmless factor because A is Lipschitz, therefore A prime is bounded. And because this factor is harmless, that means that L2 boundedness of this operator on the curve gamma with respect to the arc length measure on the curve is equivalent to L2 boundedness of, of this operator on the line, okay? Um, of course, there are many reasons that this might be of interest. Of course, if you've had a comp course in complex analysis, you know, several reasons why the Cauchy integral is of interest. It's also of interest for other reasons, which we probably won't have too much time to get into, but it turns out that once you have the L2 boundedness of this guy, there are transference techniques to let you get L2 boundedness for a huge class of singular integral operators that are not of convolution type. And there are, in particular, there are transference methods that allow you to extend up into, into higher dimensions. There's some, I'm not gonna take time this morning to, to mention more examples along that line, but in the, in the type lecture notes which have been posted, there are additional examples. All right, so related to these are the so-called Calderon commutators. Okay, so these are gonna be, again, A is gonna be this Lipschitz function. This is defined to be the principal value, one over two pi i, integral of the line. And again, there are higher dimensional analogs, but we won't say anything about that this morning. I'm not budgeting my space on the board very well. And then, of course, then we have f of y dy, okay? So, for example, notice that uh, the first commutator, you might wonder why do they call it a commutator? Well, C1a is at least formally, one can make sense of this, uh, with some normalizing constant, which I guess should be uh, minus one over two i. This is the commutator of the Hilbert transform with multiplication by the function, ah, not the Hilbert transform, the derivative composed with the Hilbert transform. Take the commutator of that with multiplication by the function a, and then apply it to the function f. Well, this is the operator, okay? Um, Calderon was interested in this particular object because um, it, was, it was the f fundamental building block for his work on building algebras of singular integral operators in order to build sort of a pseudo-differential uh, pseudo -differential calculus to treat partial differential operators that had minimally smooth coefficients, say Lipschitz coefficients. The standard pseudo-differential calculus treats C infinity coefficients, but Calderon was able to build a sort of pseudo-differential calculus to treat the case of minimally smooth coefficients and the L2 boundedness of this was, of this guy, was sort of the, the fundamental tool that he needed in order to do that, okay? So let me point out also a connection between these operators and this Cauchy integral operator, okay? Notice that if we look at this kernel here, the kernel for this operator that I'm calling C sub A, okay? All right, so what you notice is that um, one over X minus Y plus I times A of X minus A of Y. If we factor out one over X minus Y, Then we've got, uh, what's left is one over one plus i times a of x minus a of y over x minus y, which at least formally, at least if the Lipschitz constant is say less than one, you can expand in a power series and write this as one over x minus y 
times the sum, k runs from zero to infinity, of uh, minus i times a of x minus a of y over x minus y to the k. Which means that this operator, this operator CA, can be expanded in the power series in terms of, in terms of these guys. Because notice that, well, ignoring this harmless factor of negative i to the k power, this is exactly the kernel that we have for these Calderon commutators, okay? They can be, you can interpret them as iterated commutators, yeah. If you want to see the exact formula, it's actually in the notes, that's the published notes, or in the posted notes. Yeah, good question, but yeah. In fact, yes. Okay, so this leads me to a couple of definitions. Um, we're gonna give a, give a definition of a class of operators that includes these operators as special cases, and of course many more. So first of all, a calderon zygmunt kernel and for short, I'm gonna abbreviate that CZ, is a function K of XY defined on the product Rn cross Rn minus the diagonal. You'll see why we need to take away the diagonal in a second. Such that these two conditions hold. There's a, a size condition, which is that K of xy is bounded in modulus. Oh, and we're, let's say, complex value. Okay, so this is an Rn. So there's some uniform constant such that this is bounded by one over length of x minus y to the n power. And then there's a smoothest condition which is that k of x plus h y minus k of x y and the same for y plus h Right, so there's smoothest at x and y. The size of this is less than or equal to uniform constant length of h to the alpha over x minus y to the n plus alpha. Here alpha is some positive number between strictly positive and less than or equal to one. And this is to hold whenever h in modulus is less than or equal to, let's say, um, well, two times length of h is less than or equal to length of x minus y. By the way, there's a typo in the notes. The, the length of the vector was omitted. That doesn't make sense, okay? Okay, so you can see that in the case n equals one, these kernels that we're looking at have this property, right? Because A is Lipschitz and it's easy to check that uh, this kernel and, and these kernels here satisfies those conditions with n equals one uh, and with alpha equals one because, because again, A is Lipschitz, okay? And then we say that, Here we're defining the notion of a generalized calderon zygmunt operator, CZO for short, and I'll sometimes also call these SIOs for singular integral operator, is a mapping T 
from test functions to distributions. So here, remember, D is the space C0 infinity of Rn, and D prime is the, that should be a D prime there. D prime is its dual, okay? Um, which is associated to a CZ kernel in the following sense. sense that for all fg in c0 infinity with disjoint supports, the pairing of tf with g, which makes sense, g is a test function, T maps test functions to distribution, so this is a distribution. So this just means the pairing of, a, of an element in D with its dual space, okay? All right, so this is going to be equal to the integral of this kernel integrated against f of y, integrated against g of x, dy dx. Okay, and the point here is that if these guys have disjoint supports, then this integral makes sense because that keeps us away from the diagonal where, where this kernel has a singularity. Okay? So, so notice formally what we're saying Tf of x is equal to the integral in Rn k of x, y, f of y, dy. All right, and this actually makes sense if, if x is not in the support of that. Okay. So what we're going to be striving for, among other things, are boundedness in this course are going to be boundedness criteria to deal with operators of this type, not necessarily of convolution type, but which satisfy these kind of um, standard calderon zygmunt size and smoothness conditions, just like the kernels of the, of the Cauchy integral operator, for example. Okay? All right. So let me say one more thing on this topic before we move on to the next topic, which is let's recall the classical theorem of Calderon and Zygmunt dating back to 1952, which is that if T is a Calderon Zygmunt operator, of course they didn't formulate it with that language, and if T is bounded on L2. What do we mean by boundedness on L2 when initially this is only defined on test functions? It means that this pairing in absolute value is controlled by a uniform constant times the L2 norm of F times the L2 norm of G. And since C0 infinity is dense in L2, then you make an extension by company. Okay. All right. So the theorem is that if the Seeger integral is bounded on L2, then it is bounded or it extends to a bounded operator on LP, one less than P less than infinity, and it's also of weak type 1, 1. All right? <clears throat> so, of course, in 1952, Colorado and Zygmunt were only looking at convolution type operators, but in fact, their proof works the same way. It's the same proof. Convolution is really only 
and extra help improving the L2 boundedness when you can use Plancharel. Once you have L2 boundedness, LP bounds work the same way whether it's convolution type or not. It's just, a, it's just an artifact of these calderon zygmunt kernel conditions plus the calderon zygmunt method, okay? All right. So the fundamental tool for us as we, um, as we go through this course is gonna be littlewood paley theory. By which I mean the, the analysis of square functions and the use of square functions to infer boundedness of other operators, okay? So for the rest of today, we're gonna to talk about littlewood paley theory. Um, in fact, I'll maybe call this section generalized littlewood paley theory because At some point, I want to be talking about Littlewood-Paley square functions that are induced, uh, that are not of convolution type, okay? The classical Littlewood-Paley theory, of, of course, is with convolution operators, okay? So first, let me recall a couple of standard facts from uh, basic harmonic analysis. Okay, we're gonna need a couple of tools so from approximate identities. Um, so here's the setting. We're gonna let, we're suppose we have a function phi that's in L1 of Rn, um, radial and decreasing, meaning radially decreasing, decreasing as you move away from the origin, okay? All right, and we're gonna set phi sub t of x, this is in Rn, so the scaling will be t to the minus n phi of x over t. And let me recall also the, the hardy littlewood maximal function. Which is the following thing. It's mf of x is defined to be the soup over all t bigger than zero of the average over the ball of radius t centered at x of the absolute value of f of y dy. Okay, and of course, as you probably know, we can also use cubes in place of balls, and we can also work with non-centered balls or non-centered cubes. They all give equivalent operators. Okay, all right, so then I want to state a lemma whose proof is going to be left to you as an exercise. And I'm going to try to use the numerology that's actually in the typed notes, so this is lemma 2.1, all right? So you can find it in the notes, okay? So let phi be as above, okay? Uh, L1 radial decreasing. And suppose that G is some other measurable function, which is whose Absolute value or modulus is bounded by, by phi, point wise. Okay? All right, then in that case, um, if we convolve GT, GT is defined the same way as phi T. 
if we, if we convolve GT with a function f, this is going to be pointwise bounded by a dimensional constant times the L1 norm of phi times the hardy lowered maximal function of f at x, pointwise. Okay? And the proof, this is safe for all f in LP, 1 less than or equal to p less than or equal to infinity. All right? And the proof is an exercise. And there's a hint in the notes to do the exercise. Um, let me just make one brief comment. This is actually true with constant one here. Um, the argument is a little more subtle. For our purposes, having a purely dimensional constant doesn't, doesn't bother us at all. Uh, and in that case, you can prove this by sort of elementary methods, just making dyadic annular decomposition and just estimating things and adding them up, okay? And then a second related lemma. All right. So let phi and g be s in the previous lemma. Okay. And let's also suppose that um, phi, of phi of zero is finite and that uh, let's say g is continuous. Don't really need that, but it makes life slightly slim, simpler. Okay? So then, for all f in LP, 1 less than or equal to p less than or equal to infinity, we have that the non tangential maximal function, which I'll explain to you in a second what that is, of GT star f at a point x. This is by definition the soup over y, should be bigger, y and t, such that x minus y is less than t, and there's nothing special about making the aperture to the cone be one. You could have any fixed aperture if you like. Okay, and then the constant is going to depend on the aperture. And then we look at gt star f of y. This is going to be bounded also by a dimensional constant times phi of zero plus the L1 norm of phi times the hardy level maximal function of f. Uh, again, I think I will, well, not exactly leave it as an exercise, sort of an informal exercise, because actually the proof, the proof of this is in the type notes, so you can refer to that if you like, but it's basically sort of an elementary thing, so I'm not going to prove it. Yes. Is the is over all y and z, is it additive or is it just? No, this a, it's, we're taking the, it's a non-tangential maximal function. So think of a point x on the boundary, and then we're, we're looking at an arbitrary y and t, taking the supremo over all y and t in the cone. Okay? So, so, right, if the, point y and t satisfies this inequality, then it's in this cone, right? That's what we're saying. That's why it's called a non-tangential maximal function. Okay? Okay. Um, let me remind you of the definition of the Fourier transform. Let's say for initially for f and l1, f hat of c is defined to be the integral in Rn e to the 2 pi i c dot x. Some people normalize it with a minus sign, it doesn't really matter, of f of x dx. And There's a famous theorem of Plancherel, which I've already mentioned. If 
Fourier transform extends to not just a bounded operator, but an isometry. on L2, okay? All right. So the first thing that I'm actually gonna prove for you, and then notes this is proposition 2.4. Uh, this is gonna be easy. So let's let zeta be in C0 infinity on the unit ball in Rn. Um, we're gonna define an operator, QT of F is zeta T star F. Zeta T defined the same way we defined phi T earlier. It's T to the minus N, zeta of X over T. And here, besides being C0 infinity, we're gonna assume that zeta is real and radial. and the integral of zeta is zero. Hence the integral of each of the zeta t's is zero. Okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna assume that, oh, I should have said it's also non-trivial. Non-trivial so that therefore zeta hat is not zero not identically zero. Ah. Okay. All right, and so if it's non-trivial, we can normalize it so so that the integral from zero to infinity of zeta hat of t squared, what am I doing here? I'm abusing notation because if zeta is real and radial, then the invariance properties of the Fourier transform tell us that also zeta hat is real and radial. And since it's a radial function, I'm, I'm kind of abusing notation here and identifying it with a, with a naturally associated function of, of, the, of the real line, okay? So we're gonna normalize so that this is one, okay? All right, oh, why, can, why do we know that this is finite? Well, because, okay, since the integral of zeta is zero, this says that zeta hat of zero equals zero, if you just think of the definition of the Fourier transform. And if zeta is C zero infinity, then zeta hat is a Schwartz function, so infinitely smooth and rapidly decaying. Since it's rapidly decaying, the 